What's the biggest emotional driver in a human being that causes them to want to change? Pain or the fear of future pain. Life insurance, yes. fear of future pain. If you can't help them feel pain, they don't feel any need to want to change. And that's really all selling is, right? So if you can't help them relive pain or feel pain, they will never feel the urgency to want to change. And if they don't feel the urgency to change, there is no sale. All right, so do you want to know the most effective way to sell anything? Well, according to my guest today, the single most effective way to sell anything is to become a problem finder and problem solver, not a product pusher. My guest today is Jeremy Lee Miner, and I'm so excited to have him here because for those of you coming to our event in San Antonio, July 31st to February 2nd, he will be our keynote speaker on our stage in front of 2,000 plus people. And the event called Escape the Matrix for our PHP agency. So Jeremy Miner, the embodiment of, philosophy, of the, this philosophy, made him one of the wealthiest sales professionals on the planet. During his 17-year sales career, he was recognized in the direct selling industry as the 45th highest earning producer out of more than 108 million salespeople selling anything worldwide. Jeremy's earnings as a commission-only sales rep were the multiple seven figures, not just one year, not just two years, but for every year. So his company today is the seventh level, was ranked the number one fastest growing sales training company in the U.S. the last two years by Inc. Magazine's Inc. 5,000 fastest growing companies list. Interesting thing about him too as well is he's got a new book out called The New Model of Selling, Selling to an Unsellable Generation, co-authored with Jerry Acuff. So Jeremy, welcome to hey, Dallas, baby. Hey, thanks. Thanks for having me on here. It's it's Dallas. I, I flew in here from, you know, our, our corporate headquarters are in Scottsdale, Arizona, and I flew in here. And I woke up this morning, walked out, and I'm like, oh, I feel like I'm in Phoenix. It's so freaking hot here. <laughs> like, what's what's going on? It's, it's like 100, 100 degrees here at 8 o'clock in the morning with full humidity. At least in Arizona, it's like 110, but no humidity. But I'm like, I didn't leave Phoenix. I thought I was getting away, and I could wear a jacket or something. But no, no, I, I definitely need, like, shorts here for sure. Thanks for having me on. 100%. And also joined with in the studio today is my business partner here in Dallas, Texas. Curtis, what's going on, buddy? Yeah. How are you guys doing? I'm and, great. And you're off to a fantastic month. The first six, seven days of September, you'll how much have you made so far in the first six, seven days of this month? Around thirty-three thousand. Hum, so humbly spoken. Uh, you know, just, yeah, just, a, just a few dollars. Just a few dollars <laughs> helping the kids out. Well done, Curtis. Thank you, basketball man. player. I, lo I love. I love my sports people. That's I it. Love that. For your, your baseball player. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, talk to us, Jeremy, about how you got involved mm -hmm. in sales. I mean, uh, yeah. multiple seven figures. I mean, you're, yeah. you're from a. Uh, 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 you're from the country. I, you know, I, yeah, I grew up on it. I'll, I'll, so I'll, I'll give you a little bit of my background because my, my background relates to, to maybe what is necessary, you know, for anybody listening to us or watching us to, to take your sales ability to a level that I think a lot of people might not realize they could be at. So yeah. I got started in, in sales 20, I'm geez, I'm getting that old. I think 22 years ago, 23 now it could be 23 years ago. Uh, broke, burned out college student, going to school in Utah. Yeah. My man here played for the, the Utes. I didn't know him at the time, but uh, going to school in Utah. And this company, you know, is door-to-door -door sales. Uh, they basically hire everybody because it's straight commission. So no skin off their back. If you don't sell, they just, you know, you just quit, right? Yeah. And so they hired uh, hired probably a couple hundred of us to go out and sell in the summer. It's like a summer program. You go out and sell for four months during the summer. You make enough money, hopefully, or that's the pitch from them. To, to not have to work while you're going to school. So went out, got dropped off in Boise, Idaho of all places. And the company, not, I mean, back in the day, it might be better now, probably is back in the day, they'd give you a script and a couple of books by the sales gurus, okay. right? You know, who probably haven't sold anything for decades. That's a whole nother story. Mm -hmm. And they basically take you out in a van and they drop you off in a not so safe neighborhood. And I still remember, it. it's like, they kick you out of the van and they're like, hey, go make some sales. It's going to be easy. We'll pick you up after dark. And that was like my first experience of sales. And I thought it was going to be easy because that's what the recruiter said. It's going to be easy. And I still remember, I remember looking back over to my left because I was the last one to get dropped off. And my sales manager's name was Xane. I still remember he had this curly, like blonde hair. And Xane said, these words haunt me to this day. He said, Jeremy, remember 
when you knock on their door, show them how excited you are about the product. Show them your enthusiasm and how much you believe in it, and they're going to believe it. I'm like, that makes sense. I mean, what did I know? I was a 21-year-old kid. So I was like, that makes sense. You know, if I'm excited about it, then somehow magically they're going to want to buy it. You know, I didn't know. So I started knocking on the doors and really excited and saying that we're the number one this and we have the best product here and the best service and the best customer service and we've helped all these people and blah, 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 blah. And I started noticing from the very first door, I started getting all these objections. I, 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 they didn't tell me about this, you know, when they recruited me, like, we can't afford it. Uh, we don't need it. Uh, your price is too high. We already talked with somebody from your company. Uh, I need to think it over. I need to do more research. Uh, I'm interested. Can you call me back in a week, a month, a year later? You know, how many people uh, listening to us sure. have ever heard those, right? And so I finally got to a point, probably, geez, seven, eight weeks in, barely making any sales. You're straight commission. You don't make sales. You don't make money. And I remember standing on the curb one late it was Friday or Saturday night. She usually works six days a week in those summer programs. And the managers come to pick me up. I'd made zero sales that day, zero dollars. I'd worked 12 hours. And in fact, that week I'd made zero sales. So I remember standing there on the corner, like, you know, like sweat coming, you know, I mean, imagine selling sure. door to door in, in Dallas in the summer. If you were oh, there. Yeah. Sweat, right. you know, <laughs> bulging. At least I was in Boise. It wasn't as bad. If Dallas, I would have melted, but sweat rolling down my chest. You know, you're, if you've ever done door to door, your legs like feel like jello after, course, after a day. Sure. And I remember sitting there like thinking, you know, maybe, maybe selling just wasn't for me. Mm-hmm. You know, I wasn't born with the gift of the gab, like all the top guys in the company and gals, like maybe it just wasn't for me. And I remember when I got into that van that night, uh, the manager popped in a Tony Robbins CD. It, it, and it's kind of crazy. Like people li- used to listen to these like round things like yeah. 22 years ago called CDs. And Tony said something like this, uh, and I, I could be butchering it, but he said, most people, uh, like you will fail. Yeah, here it was. So you will fail if you don't learn the right skills necessary to succeed, like you will fail if you don't learn the right skills. Now he goes on to say that everyone is taught skills, but he said the people who, who fail, who don't do as well are the ones who are just not taught the right ones. Mm -hmm. And it's like, when I heard that, it was like something I'd never heard in my life. And like I said, you know, 21, 22, you, you, you're kind of learning all this stuff, but it made me, it was like a light bulb moment went off in my head that, you know, there was a difference in skill level. See, I just thought like all sales was just sales, right? right? And if you work the hardest, you'd make the most money because that's kind of what was indoctrinated in us. And so I'm like, okay, I have to acquire a much more advanced sales ability than I currently have. So at the same time, I was in school, like I was talking to you, and my major was behavioral science and social dynamics, which I won't give you the scientific stuff. It's kind of boring, but it's really the study of the brain and how human beings make decisions. Like, why do they say no compared to saying yes? And which is really sales. Mm. And so like one of my professors, have you ever heard of uh, Robert Caldini? Robert Caldini. Yeah, he's the head of behavioral science at at Arizona State University. I took one of his online courses when I was in Utah, but he uh, he has a book called Persuasion and Influence. He's massive in that space. And so I started learning from- Persuasion. Yeah, persuasion. It's pretty cool. Is that persuasion? Yeah, persuasion. Social, uh, yeah, social suasion. There's a whole bunch of things. But I started learning from Robert and uh, other professors that the most persuasive way to communicate, they were saying was over here. Whereas all the sales gurus in their books, they were saying it was here. So it was like exact opposite. So I'm like, how do I take what I'm learning about the brain, like behavioral science, and how do I, how do I take that in and, and put that into a sales process? Because mm-hmm. it's not like when you go to school for behavioral science, they're like, these are the right questions to ask, and here's how to use your tone, and here's how to shift from a, a, a challenging tone to more of a, a concerned tone. Uh-huh. You know, like they don't teach you that type of stuff, but I'm like, how do I take what I'm learning about the brain and wrap that into like a step-by-step process. How do I get my prospects to, you know, do all the work? That's what we're big on. Like, how do you get your prospects to do all the work? How do you get them to sell themselves? How do you get them to overcome their own objections? And how do you get them to pull you in? Mm -hmm. And that's what I started learning. Whereas the gurus, they were saying, you got to push, you got to pressure, you got to convince all those type of things. What was what was the major difference? So I started acquiring those skills, and you know, selling pretty much became very very easy and mm. extremely profitable. And kind of that's that the rest is history. And pe- people happened. often think that you know sales is you know the guy you meet at the dealership or or you're from the hood, you know, right. the guy at the corner, yeah. you know, or or in order for you to win in sales, somebody's got to lose. 
uh, or 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 this way you got to hustle up on somebody. Yeah. But what I've realized with sales yeah. coming out the military, I have no background in sales. Yeah. Uh, not even a good communicator. Yeah. Is that if I learned how to sell? Yeah. I'd be I'd be never without a job. Yeah. I'd yeah. always find a job. I find my way into job, let alone yeah. commission sales. Yeah. I sell myself an interview yeah. or later on to learn how to sell myself so my wife would want to date me. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. oftentimes people don't yeah. want to invoke yeah. that skill set because yeah. they don't want to look like a fool. Well, and I think, I think the reason why is because th that's the way they're trained. So society in large views salespeople as what type of status? Low, Low. status. Yeah. Yes. And why do they view salespeople that way? Because there would be no economy if there weren't no sales. Bingo. That's it. But yeah. why are they viewed that? So that's why I tried to break down. Like, why are salespeople viewed at a much lower status in the rest of society? It's simply because of the way they've been made or forced to actually communicate that triggers mm -hmm. society to react that way. Yeah. Okay. Because it's not like people don't like to buy but they don't like being sold. So you brought up a really good point that, you know, you, you thought you, you've always looked at sales before in the past yeah. as like you against the prospect, trying to win them over, yeah. manipulate them, pressure I win, them you lose. so yeah. you can make yeah, yeah. money, right? Yeah. See, that's what, can I say something that might offend Drop some it. people? That's what average salespeople do. That's what average salespeople <laughs> think like. And once again, it's not their fault. They were forced to learn it that way, but it is their what? It is their problem. If you want to be a top 1% earning salesperson, whether it's insurance or, or whatever field you're in, you have to view selling as collaborative. It's you working with the prospect to help them find and solve problems that maybe they didn't even understand they had, right? Because mm -hmm. when you first start talking to a prospect, let's go to insurance, right? Mm -hmm. That's where you're, you know, your, your industry. Uh, when you talk about insurance, it's not like, you know, when you call that lead that requested information, it's not like that lead really understands what their real problems are. Do right. they sit around with like an Excel spreadsheet two weeks before, like writing out all the scenarios? Like if I die tomorrow, here's what my family is going to be left with compared to one year, three years out, you know, uh, 36 months out, you know, five years out, 10 years, like no, no prospect sitting there breaking yeah. it down. And when you call yeah. them like, oh, I'm already ready. I understand all my problems and what I need. Most prospects, when you first start talking to them, they might recognize they have somewhat of a problem, yeah. but they don't understand how bad the problem really is. Right. They especially don't understand the consequences of what happens if they don't do anything about those problems. So when, when we, when we train salespeople, not only do we train them to help a prospect find one problem, but we want to help them help the prospect find maybe two or three or four or five other problems that the prospect didn't realize they had. Yeah. Yeah. And when they're able to do that, it builds such a massive gap from where the prospect is. You know, we call a lot of people call that their current state or current situation to where they want to be. We call that their objective state. Yeah. And what's the gap? The gap are all these newfound problems that your questioning ability and your tonality ability allow the prospect to internalize they have that they really didn't know they had or understood they had before you started talking. Bam, that's wow. it. There you it's go. It's part of the exploratory process. Yeah. You know, the uh, the skill set, if you guys are have been watching my channel for any period of time, is seven figure squads to help you become a millionaire. Well, one of the ways you become a millionaire, a primary way, way for you to become a millionaire is to think differently about how you do everything. And this process of rethinking the way you look at the skill set of sales. So C yeah. Curtis, you know, you, tra you train salespeople too as well. You know, you, yeah. you've, you've grown offices across the country and you started office. You, now you're partnering with me here in, in Dallas, which is awesome yes. to have you in, in your yeah. spring here. Spring was on a, a, a few episodes ago. Yeah. And so, um, uh, what some of the objections and some of the shortfalls is you, you recruit people from scratch. I mean, you're, we're building them up in entrepreneurship. We're building up in right. insurance. What's some of the key areas that you would say you you'd run across in terms of their, you know, their, their stone walls with, with sales. Yeah. I think that uh, you, you guys kind of mentioned it is that most people, when they're approached, they're thinking, okay, wh what are you pitching? They're, they're guarding they're already, your guard already yeah. up. So yeah. I think when we're training, uh, one of the biggest things is trying to make the uh, the agent, the partner, the one that's actually discussing the conversation mm -hmm. with them is to disarm yeah. the prospect. Oh, right? where'd you get that disarm word? Yeah. Right. Uh, what, good word. What's huh? going on? Maybe I like that. Is that yeah. trademarked? <laughs> <laughs> trademarked? 
<laughs> yeah, disarm them, put the guard down and, yeah. and understand that this is a win-win situation for both parties. So, yeah. I, I mean, I remember when I was approached with sales, I used to think that all sales and manipulation, like yeah. here's this pin. And then I was like, you're selling me this pin for ten dollars, but I know it only costs like fifty cents to make, right? Yeah, like yeah, so, yeah, like that's all yeah. manipulation in my head, right? Yeah. Until I remember at our, um, having a conversation with one of my coaches, mm. um, and it says it's not a bad deal mm. if it's actually a solution to their problem, right? Yeah. Kind of what you yeah. mentioned already. Yeah. So one of the major issues that I see consistently is just really breaking down the mindset when you're mm. sitting in front of them, knowing that you're there to actually help them, yeah, versus just trying to make money on yeah. them. You know the best and, way to do that? What's that? How to use your tone? Yeah. Ooh, I'm I'm serious. But I, I've now, noticed that with you that yeah. even since this morning breakfast. Yeah, oh, yeah. I've I've, I've noticed you that notice? about you. you. You're 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 aware uh, of your tonality. Yeah. I mean, just getting to know us. I was going to know you yeah. in person is one yeah. thing that does get to yeah. online. Yeah. But you're also very good at pacing your well. Communication words. is something that you, you like. We, we go back to you want to become a top one percent earner. Like communication is not something where you put your headset on and go into sales mode when you're calling your leads or yeah. get on Zoom or appointment. Like communication, like once you learn these skills, it's how you are twenty four hours a day, seven days a week. So when you get on the phone and you talk with a prospect. It's just very natural. You don't right. like change to like a different person, <laughs> but your tone, I think this is so interesting because you, you know, you talk about disarming the prospect. You know, we, we talk about that, the ABDs of selling always be disarming, mm -hmm. right? How do you cause the, the prospect? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> We'll come back to the ABCs. Keep that thought. I'll come back. Yeah. To that. Yeah. So the, the ABDs of selling, that's actually yeah. our next book, ABDs of selling, but always be disarming. How do we cause the prospect to want to let their guard down and open up and actually go below the surface. The the primary way you do that is through your tone. And when I say that to a lot of salespeople, are like, what do you mean my tone? <laughs> well, your tone is how your prospect uh, interprets the intention behind what you're saying. Hmm. Your tone is how they interpret the meaning of yeah. what you're asking, yeah. right? So when I was just talking with you guys, you probably interpreted certain things I was saying because I had more of a curious tone, right? Right. Correct. Can, compared to if I was more confused, like I'm not understanding. How did you mean by, see, that's a confused tone, right? Mm -hmm. So we talk about the four C's of tone. There's the curious tone. Uh, maybe walk me through. What do you have in place now? Like when, you know, when, when Dan does pass away that would pay the mortgage, if I'm selling insurance, yeah. that's a curious tone. Yeah. So my prospect interprets me asking that because I'm curious, right. right? If I just ask that in a regular, just, can you tell me what you guys have in place now when somebody passes away? It doesn't have the same effect, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Sounds or, like chat GPT. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly right. Like, yeah. Or if I'm, you know, if I'm, if I want to use the second way of the tone, we call that the confused tone. I even call it the confused old man. And sometimes when I do reels on it, people are like, oh, you should never be confused. Like you should always be like, so like, you know, everything. And I'm like, well, yeah, that's why you make what you do right now. Yeah. Cause you don't understand <laughs> how to, you don't understand wow. how to confusion. <laughs> it doesn't right, mean, jab, it right. doesn't mean that you're you, <laughs> it doesn't it doesn't mean when you go into your presentation you act like you don't know what you're talking about but if i'm if they say something that i want more clarification on or if i want to help them relive the pain so let's say mm -hmm. i'll give you an example of this let's stick with life insurance you want to do that yes please so let's say that they you know so just just so i understand has you know what is something recently happened that's caused you to to look into life insurance options see that's more of a curious tone. Yeah. And they might say, well, you know, my, my brother, you know, had a heart attack, you know, yeah. six months ago. Oh, how do you mean he had a, what happened? Right. So I'm kind of almost con yeah. curious yeah. there. Yeah. Okay. In that tone. So they're going to open up mm -hmm. now when that happened, like what, what happened to their family? What happened to their actual family? Right. Oh, uh, see, now I'm shifting into a concern tone, right? right. That concern tone allows mm -hmm. them to like emotionally open up. Okay. Or if I'm, if I want, you know, go back to the confused tone, uh, John, when you said that something happened with one of your family members, how, how, how did you mean by that? See, I'm confused. That's a confused tone. Yeah. Confusion causes the prospect to want to do what? To come to your rescue, yeah. to clarify what you're talking about. So if I want to ask a clarifying question, how did you mean when you said, see, that's a confused tone. Like I'm not understanding right. that causes it's them great. to open up. Okay. And then we have a challenging tone. Well, what are the, what, what are the consequences if you don't do anything about this and you end up passing away years before you thought you would, how would Cindy be able to pay for the mortgage at that point? And then I go into a concern tone. 
right? A, a tone that shows more empathy. So I start off with a challenging tone to trigger that emotion, right, in their brain. And then I end that with a concern tone where they feel like, oh, he's concerned for me if we don't do anything about this, which causes them to do what? Open up. Trust you more. So it's three C's. Like well, there's one more. Oh, snap. Uh, okay. okay. So, was, so, you, was... so you've got the, you've got the, you've got the, you've got the, you got the four C. So you've got the curious yes. tone. Mm -hmm. You got the confused tone. Okay. A lot of people don't understand that. Confused, confused tone. You got the uh, challenging oh, tone. Challenge, yeah. And then you've got the concern tone, the tone that shows more empathy, right? So your tone is how they, they start. Can I, you want me to give you some brain studies? That's good. I'm like a behavioral science geek. So, I like that one. <laughs> so, so the, the, there's By the way, for those who are watching this right now, drop the four C's in the comment section yes. below. Who knows? If we pick your comment, we might even uh, get you a book uh, of the the, uh, the new... The new model. I was going to sign these books for you. Oh, Not that that's I'm awesome. that cool, but I wanted to give you guys these two books because I thought you guys were so awesome having us over right. here. You're helping people make more money. Of course you're that cool. You know, here and there, we, we do our best. Okay, so let's go back to the tone. I digress. So we go back to our tone. So the way, you're, the, way the human brain works is let's say that you're in a parking lot and you hear somebody shout. You're at a, a grocery store and you're out in the parking lot pushing a cart and somebody's like, just they start yelling. As a human being, the first thing you're going to do, it, that goes into what's called your survival part of your brain, mm -hmm. or a lot of people call it the reptilian part of your brain. Okay. Some people call it the croc brain. Let's just call it the re reptilian part of your brain. So instantly, the first things that your brain uh, hears is the tone. They don't hear the words first. Because when you get a telemarketing call and after like 10 seconds, you're like not interested, do you ever like go and like, I don't even know what they were doing. Like yeah. you, you don't hear the words, yeah. but you hear their tone, right. really excited, high pitched, and that triggers fight or flight mode. Yeah. And you say not interested. It's a defensive mechanism in our brain, right? Yeah. There's a whole other story. So let's say you hear somebody yell at the, at the, at, in the parking lot at the grocery store. You instantly go like this because you're like, am I safe? Am I about to sure. get shot? Like what's mm -hmm. going on? And then typically within like a second or two, her words, let's say it's a lady yelling, go up into what we would call the midbrain. And that's where they're, you're trying to interpret the words. And then that instantly goes into what's called your neocortex, mm -hmm. which is your problem solving part of your brain. And that's where you're like, oh, she's just selling at her son to be careful crossing the street. See, but it all starts. You hear the sound, the tone yep. first, yep. and then you interpret the words second. And most salespeople don't understand that. They think like, hey, if I've got these great words, I'm going to make all these sales. But really, every book will tell you like, hey, you know, 73% of the sale is by your verbal and nonverbal skills. And that's in every book. I think every sales trainer is copy and pasted that for probably a hundred years, yeah, yeah, yeah. but then nobody actually trains you what that actually means. The, the nonverbal, the, yeah, the, the, the tone. Yeah. yeah. Like your tonality is how, so like if I'm calling an aged lead for mm -hmm. insurance and if I'm coming across super excited yeah. and salesy, do we wonder why they say I, I don't need insurance or I've already got insurance within like 10 seconds right. compared to if I cut and they've already got 10 phone calls from other agents that sounded pitchy and mm -hmm. excited. But if I'm coming in with like a, a lower tone, uh, it looks like you had filled out some information, you know, requesting different options about life insurance. Now, did you happen to find something or what happened with that? See, I go into that curious tone. Yeah, yeah. I'm more low key. I'm more relaxed. Yeah. That causes the prospect to let their guard down. Because mm -hmm. if we can't get them to let their guard down, that's this will always grief. You know, a lot of sales trainers will be like, oh, when you get the, I want to think it over objection or the money objection, that's where the sale begins. And I'm like, well, that sounds cool. I, I understand that. It's kind of a trendy thing to say, but really the sales begins at hello, because the sale can be won or lost within the first 30 seconds of any sales conversation. Because if you cause them to want to let their guard down where they become curious to open up to you, mm -hmm. you're more than likely, far more likely to make that sale compared to if you immediately trigger sales resistance where their guard goes up and now you're competing with their guard up the whole rest of the way. And now when you ask questions, anybody ever wonder why when you ask good questions, the prospect gives you generalized, vague, surface level answers yeah. did they plan on that before you called them did they have that all planned out they woke up that morning like when that salesperson calls me today at 3 15 because their tone sounds a little bit salesy i'm going to stay on the call with them for about 10 minutes but i'm going to pretty much stay surface level when they ask me questions i'm just going to give them like vague short answers and then i'm going to say i want to think it over at the end see that's not all planned out that those are triggered reactions yeah from the salesperson that's caused the prospect to react that way. And as a salesperson, once you understand that, then you're like, okay, I need to go back and make some changes. 
The, the interesting thing about learning sales, okay, we're thinking about building our businesses and, mm -hmm. and selling a product and recruiting people to our company, yeah, which is all good. But as I'm hearing you, I'm thinking to myself, oh, I should approach my, my wife that way. <laughs> I should approach my kids that way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I should approach, right? I should approach, you know, whoever in, in a much, so it's not just being a better salesperson mm. just for the sake of making money. Yeah. It's helped me become a better human being. Hey, is it a, is it a crazy idea <laughs> if we went to that Indiana Jones film tonight? Why would I say, is it a crazy idea? Because they're probably going to say, no, it's not crazy. Right. See, I, that's another example. Like I, you know, a lot of sales trainers are like, you got to get them to say yes seven times during the presentation and you've got a 71 percent chance to make the sale there's no data on that just so everybody knows there's no proof of that but that's a whole nother story uh but i i there's a lot of circumstances where i want the prospect to say no yeah. because that leads to the yes and i'll be like you never want them to say no because if they say no you're less likely i'm like well what data do you have to support that so if i'm if i'm cold calling i might say well would you be opposed to having a conversation around that no i'm not opposed but that's that's easier because they already want to say no. Would you be opposed to right. talking about that? No, I'm not opposed. What do you have? Right? It's hard for them to you know hard for them to say yes. I'm opposed. Right? But that's if what, I said, that's are what you drew me open? into your IG. Yes. Oh, really? Did when I, I started watching you, you go. That's what draw. Uh, that's what drew me into your IG content. Yeah. Uh, Jordan, can we take a look at this uh, um, screen here? Um, I love your content on IG. And guys, if you haven't followed Jeremy, make sure you follow. If you're in sales, you're growing a business, you need to follow Jeremy Lee Miner. But here's five things to avoid in sales because he's going to drop things like this on his profile. Uh -huh. So can we unpack this? Yeah, sure. So assuming the sale too early, being a yeah. product pusher, lowering your status, yeah. sounding script. So for example, last night I was with our newest guys. They're coming from real estate. They're transitioning to an insurance. Yeah. And right away she starts talking to somebody else about the IUL. Mm -hmm. And yeah. the first thing that goes to my head is like, well, you're brand new to the insurance industry. Product you're, pushing. You're, not, you're 90 days in insurance business. Okay, so yeah. let's unpack that. Yeah, so let's just talk about what she did. She's being a product pusher. Now, like I said, that's not her fault. That's typically how most of those people are trained, but it is or what? It is our problem, right? Mm -hmm. So if we're talking about IULs, we're probably wanting to find out more about what they're currently doing to invest for retirement, right? We're wanting to find out what their real situation is, and then we want to start building a gap and then finding out where they want to be, and then we can bring in how we might have something that can get her there. But if we're just focused on the product in the beginning, product pushing, uh, your prospects, unless they're a lay down sale, are pretty much going to, you know, probably like the person did. You probably okay. started seeing a shift in their body language. Like, oh, yeah, we already have somebody for that. Or like, right. oh, I don't need that. Or I've got a guy for that. Or yeah, my uncle you know, does it. My, my uncle love. does that, even though <laughs> that they've never bought anything from the uncle. <laughs> right, um, right, so, right. We, we, you know, most salespeople have been trained that. So what, what we train salespeople to do, like we talked about earlier, is how to become a problem finder. Because a lot of sales trainers will say, hey, you got to be a problem solver. I totally agree with being a problem solver, but problem solving doesn't happen until after they purchase from you, right? No, you can't be a problem no. solver until yeah. after they purchased and whatever you are selling solves their problem. Yeah. That's when you are a problem solver. So if you wanna be really, really great at selling, you yep. have to be really, really good at problem finding. And like I said, that's helping the prospect find problems they didn't realize they even had. Because if I can only help them find one problem or one reason why they should change, right. and then let's say something happens during that time of that conversation and then buying where they're like, well, you know, I could do this over here, or I could do this over here, and then they cancel or don't buy, that's completely different than if I help them find five things that they want to change or five problems. Because now if, if one of them gets eliminated by the friend that does this, there's still four other reasons oh. for them to want to change. And it's almost impossible for them to want to cancel or buyers or more so those type of things. That, so that's called problem finding. So you want to be a top one percenter, you got to get really, really great at problem finding. And by the way, guys, if you're watching this right now, What's some of the products you know you've been pushing? Put in the comment section below versus using this approach. Yeah. And that's why, for those of you coming to our conference in in, uh, in San Antonio, Texas, January 31st to February 2nd, imagine having an hour with, with this guy live in person. And we just might have a contest for our top guys to have a special training session, not for yeah. everybody, but just yeah. between a few folks and Jeremy. You want me to back. teach some tactical training at that session? Like I, for insur life insurance? Life insurance is, we train 158 industries. Life insurance, like I was telling you, is our, our largest industry we train now. So I can train you all sorts for of For sure. Stuff we'll, have some, we'll have some details on how to do that. So let's let's talk about that. So yeah. I got our methodology and obviously I'm yeah. here to improve. I want to grow too as well. Yeah. I forget the fact that I've been in the insurance industry for 24 years. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a brand new student. So yeah. what would then be 
the better approach for our new guys and gals to reach out to their friends and family. Well, like if they're over there, like recruiting for like the, the, that aspect. Yeah. So, I mean, or, let me give you an example. Either way, so let's say you're recruit, driving down yeah. the road with a friend. Yeah. I just want to give an example. This will be interesting because everybody like, oh yeah, I do that. I'm guilty. <laughs> so you're driving down the road with a friend and they're like, oh God, I hate my job. Like I just got, you know, a pay cut. I just, you know, I'm worried I'm going to get fired. I just blah, oh, blah, I blah, blah, blah. And oh, what, what would, what would most people do? Oh my gosh, you do. You, I can't believe it. Yeah, it's so horrible. Let me tell you about this thing I just got involved That's in. It. it is so good. In fact, there's this guy I know. He makes multiple seven figures a year. I want you to come over to his house. There's a Zoom recording. I want to show it to you. And then the person looks at him like, oh, like one of those things. No, I'm uh, not interested. Yeah, yeah. Even though they said they don't like their yes. job, they're not making enough money. They don't have enough time because you jumped into your solution so quickly mm. without building a gap. Yeah. They have nothing to reference on. They feel like they're being sold, so they instantly shut down. Like I said, it's a defensive mechanism that human beings have. You know, three million years ago or whenever God put the first humans here on the planet, I don't know when that was or how many times. That could be debatable. Right. Huh? But your your your, idea. Your, sur <laughs> your your survival part of your brain yeah. uh, like, you know, protected you from the saber-toothed tigers coming oh, by. Right, right, right. But it's the same thing in our age. You're, you know, you're still like, oh, am I going to get eaten by something? But – you're also protecting yourself against like marketing messages and sales messages because human beings are constantly being sold to all of the time. Mm -hmm. And when I say that, they're like, oh, I, no, I only talk to a salesperson once every couple of weeks. I'm like, actually, no, you don't. Because when you wake up in the morning and besides going to the bathroom, what's the first thing you do? Look at your phone. You get on your social media. Yeah, so yeah. You start Instagram going down meeting. Facebook, yeah, IG, yeah. whatever your favorite place is, and you see what? Ads yeah. trying to sell you something. So oh. instantly right there, ads trying to sell you something. Then you walk into your kitchen, you start pouring some coffee or whatever you do, turn on the TV. What do you see? Mm -hmm. Commercials trying to sell you something. You get in your car, you turn on the radio, yeah, driving to yeah, work. Yeah. You hear radio ads yeah. trying to sell you something. You go down the road, you see what Bill signs, billboards, billboards yeah. trying to sell you something. Oh, you right. take your lunch break or probably not your lunch break, but right, you get to work, you're back on social media and now your aunt is pitching her latest, greatest Tupperware party or whatever. So you're constantly being sold to all of the time. And because of that, human beings have built up defensive mechanisms in yeah. their brains mm -hmm. that when we feel like we're sold to, we shut down emotionally. Yeah. We try to protect ourselves. Happens every day. That's it. So the, the approach then should be yeah. then asking more questions. I say, so about hold, that. hold on. What do you What do you mean you there got you go. demoted? That, that'd be the uh, see, cur I'm a curious, curious tone. Oh gosh. Uh, <laughs> see, I'm, I see. I want to like help it. them relive their pain. Gems, right? Right. Now. Because yeah. and and you know a lot of people. I I did a, a keynote uh, last. I took most of the summer off from keynotes. I'm like, I don't want to do keynotes. I'm going to relax. And then I ended up working more, but that's a whole nother story. So my last keynote I did was, I think, uh, was it last May or early June? Was it somewhere in that range? It was in Miami. It was at this uh, hedge fund conference. And this lady came up to me and she's like, you know, Jeremy, I'm just having a, I just have a hard time. I feel guilty about helping my prospects like feel pain. And I'm like, well, hmm. what's the biggest emotional driver in a human being that causes them to want to change pain or the fear of pain? future pain, life insurance, yeah. fear of future pain. Right. If you can't help them feel pain, they don't feel any need to want to change. And that's really all selling is. Selling is all about change. It's about how good you are at getting the prospect to view in their mind that by purchasing what you're offering, let's say insurance, the policy, yeah. you know, that is far less risky for them than them doing nothing at all. Yeah. The problems stay the same. They stay in the status quo and nothing ever changes. Like which is more risky, right? So if you can't help them relive pain or feel pain, they will never feel the urgency to want to change. And yeah. if they don't feel the urgency to change, there is no sale. Mm -hmm. And I, when I told her that, she's like, oh my gosh, so pain is good. I'm like, yes, pain is very good for good. you. If you can't help them feel, you always hear that in books, no pain, no sale. But Nobody really elaborates what that means. Yeah, so I want them, that person, like, hold, hold on. What, what do you mean you got demoted? And, and how long ago did that happen? Oh, so and what, what did they demote your side? Oh, so they 10% less. Mm -hmm. Has that, that had an impact on you guys? Oh, gosh, you have no idea. See, now I'm helping them relive their pain. Like I'm probing and clarifying mm -hmm. off that. Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to ask more questions, help them relive the pain. And then I can come in like, you know, I might have something that, could work for you. I'm not sure yet. See, I'm yeah. still more neutral. I'm yeah. more, I'm more unbiased. See, that's the way you want to come across, especially if you're doing that type of, if you're recruiting and yeah. stuff, I might have something for you, but I'd have to know a little bit more 
You know, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm neutral. Yeah. Most salespeople come in so assumptive. Like I've got the greatest thing for you. And that immediately triggers most people to like right close away. up. I wasn't asking uh, for a solution. Yeah. I didn't, yeah, exactly. Like your solution dumping. And I, yeah. and I, I call that pitching. I even tell, you know, I was at this mastermind, um, you know, three weeks ago in, in Vegas with some, some pretty successful companies. There was like 10 companies in the room. You're only invited there if your company does a certain amount of revenue. And so one of the people that was talking, he's like, you know, I got to do better with my pitch. I, you know, and he pitches from stage or he sells from stage. Mm -hmm. Like I got to get really better at my pitch. And I'm like, can I suggest something to you? It's like, when you say the words pitch or pitching or closing, you are quite literally, the way the brain works is you're hypnotizing your brain to think pitch mode all the time. And pitching, how is that looked at on in society at large? Pitching. Is that a good thing uh, that people like to be pitched? No, no, no. Negative it's, connotation. It's they like negative to be connotation. Caught, that's for sure. It's yeah. negative yeah. connotation. Yeah. So yeah. I'm like, I'm like, yeah. when you go into your pitch on stage, I can pretty much assure you, you get more nervous, you start talking faster, and you have more anxiety because you don't view pitching as anything good either, because you don't like to be pitched. And he's like, No, I don't. I'm like, Well, I'll show you on YouTube. And I showed him literally started, he starts to go into speech. Like he starts getting excited and like starts talking really, really fast. And he, you can tell he's yeah. nervous yeah. because he's going into his pitch. pitch. And I'm like, just say, Hey, I need to get better with my call to actions. Mm -hmm. Cause that's more neutral. Or I need to get better at my presentation so I can help more of my community, you know, get the training they need to get where they want to be. And when you start thinking differently like that, when you go into your presentation or your call to action, you don't feel nervous because you feel like you're doing them a favor by allowing them to purchase what you're offering, which you are. hundred percent you are. Yeah. Um, let's talk about- What would you like to know? The question that every salesperson gets nervous answering. What? When they're getting introduced or they're at a chamber of commerce meeting- Can and you just networking. tell me how much it's gonna cost? Close. Okay. Here, here we go. You ready for the journey? Yeah. So what is it that you do? What you do yeah. yeah. So what I would do, so what would, what would most people do? Well, uh, if they sold real estate, like, oh, I'm a real estate agent. Well, in the prospect's mind, they just, just put you over there with all the other real estate everybody. agents mm -hmm. they know, sure. right? So there's nothing different about you. If you sold insurance, like, oh, I'm an insurance consultant. Okay, I know 20 people like that. They just don't view you. They, don't, they wouldn't view the same. So what I'd want to do is I wanna, I'd want to tell them how what I do helps other people. So I might talk about, you know, give me, give me like in your mind, two to three, like two major problems that most prospects have that you talk uh, about. Well, first one is a lack of cash flow. Okay. So people if you're to paycheck. Yeah. So what I would say, so I would say, well, what I do is, you know, how a, a lot of people nowadays are, you know, frustrated with, you know, um, corporate downsizing, the, the lack of job security, and really the higher cost of living with all the inflation going on. And I'm not in my head and they're like, yeah, because they can identify with that. So what I do is I help people like that, and then I go into what I do. So what yeah. I do is I help people like that start their own full or, or part-time businesses so they can make more money and have more time with their families. What do you do? Bam. On my back. Okay. Now, I'd probably specify that more with insurance. I'd have to look at what we've written for that. But I want to tell them how what I do helps other people. So I want to name two or three problems that anybody I talk to can identify with. Mm -hmm. So if I'm recruiting, you know how a lot of people uh, get frustrated with, you know, the you know, corporate downsizing going on, the, the, the lack of, you know, you know, high wages and especially, you know, the cost of living with all the inflation going on. If, if the news is talking about inflation, everybody's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So what I do is I help people like that. And then I go over how I yeah. help them. And then I'm immediately going to ask a question. What do you do for a living? Right back in it. You don't want to just stop. Another question we get asked all the time is, yeah. Matt, I, how do you talk to an attorney? How do you talk to an athlete? How do you talk to a construction worker? How do you talk to a chiropractor? How you talk? And in my generality and yeah. probably for my lack of really articulate as well because i'm understanding you too as well that how you talk to anyone is how you talk to everyone yeah with yeah. these core principles yeah uh could you demolish I mean, that I, or, or see help that's improve that's that? just that's once again it's not their fault it's just their yeah. problem but they probably read books where you got to identify the 17 different personalities when you're on a sales call <laughs> oh, I, I hate to tell everybody that but you know <laughs> e even me when i was in sales making multiple seven figures you're in commissions i wouldn't know how to do that and how, how are you going to read a personality in the first like 30 seconds or a couple minutes of a sales conversation? That would be pretty hard, uh, yeah. even for top, top people in the world. So what I, what I, I don't, 
I think that makes for interesting reading, but to say like, oh, you have to have to talk to an attorney this way, or you have to talk to a chiropractor so this way. Yeah. It's so confusing yeah. that your sales, there's no duplication. Yeah, the biggest correct. reason why, because people always ask us like, how, how, are you, how are you guys able to go into any industry and duplicate? Well, the reason is we don't personality sell. <laughs> Because if your personality is selling based on charm and charisma, no, just, you're only going to have a few percentage of your salespeople that can pick that up and actually true. duplicate it. Whereas the average person, they're not going to be able to do that. So our biggest, you know, motto when we go into to corporations is like, hey, we're going to take your salespeople that you're about to fire that are horrible, and we're going to make them average. Now, they might have some of the low performers that become number one because they put more work in it, but we're at least going to take your people that you're about to fire and make them average. Yeah. We're going to take your average salespeople, we're going to make them really, really good, and we're going to take your really, really good salespeople you have now, and we're going to make them into legends. That's beautiful. And you do that, you're talking about quadrupling yes. your your revenue of your yeah. company. And we're, yeah. we're talking about even you know Fortune 500 companies here. So uh, in my mind, it's just, it's how you use your tonality and the questions you ask. Now, if I know that I'm speaking to like, some type of engineer eventually, when I go through my presentation, yeah. I'll probably put in more details. Correct. But am I gonna change the questions completely? Now it might, I might change them a little bit based on uh, if they're more of an A-type personality, I might, because by that time I've kind of figured out that they're more driven, especially mm -hmm. a business owner. So I might say, instead of saying, you know, using phrases like, can you walk me through what you guys do? That sounds a little bit too consultative. Mm -hmm. I might be like, what do you guys do here? Yeah. And I just make it more conversational, right. you know? So there's a few tweaks, but not not much. Jordan, can you uh, cue that clip? Um, I, I know we don't call it call letter office, but right. I think the, the premise is true. Uh, this is a video of the, okay. of the legendary Grant Cardone versus Jordan Belfort, the Wolf of Wall Street, because these are two sales uh, guys, two sales training guys, yeah. like heavyweight battle going at it. Uh, and I, heard, obviously, I heard about this. I never watched it, but I heard about it. And, if you go watch the whole thing, you're gonna find out who the clear winner is because ah, this, okay. this is a, it's an epic takedown. Okay. But let's, let's let's take a look. I would love your reaction on this. Oh, okay. The problem I see is that salespeople get a lot of people. They have a fear of cold calling, yeah. so they'll the use as an excuse to not cold call to talk to someone for too long. They know he's not gonna buy. They get into casual conversations. They go yeah. to fucking Pluto. Yeah, and well, that, they don't that, they don't pick up next call. That, so that's what bothers yeah, me yeah. about doing that. Yeah. Well, then they're not trained. Because they shouldn't be having casual well, so, conversations. We shouldn't yeah. be talking about the weather and sports and right, politics. But, but, you know, in the absence of 24-7 supervision, that's what salespeople do. They do. Well, there should be 24 hours. There should be 24-7 right. uh, supervision. They should be, the phone calls should be recorded. The right. manager should know exactly what they opened with. But in the real world, though, that's not possible. In thing. my real world, it's possible. I know, but in your not, real world, maybe it's not. But in your in real, world, real world, everybody's you know, using drugs. <laughs> so in my real world, <laughs> yeah, fucking nobody's using drugs. <laughs> So was, was my interpretation of cold calling or them going back and forth? Uh, Someone got offended. It, it, it's because what, what the, Cardone's making the argument where, yeah. where you got to make everybody could be very well scripted and, and personality. Yeah. Jordan Belfort's like, listen, I've ran a sales floor. Yeah. Yeah. You know, he ran the yeah. boiler room in yeah. Wall Street. Yeah. You, you can't do 24 hours. Seven. Yeah. So basically, he's talking about your point. Yeah. If I can just get the low people to be average. Yeah. And if you watch The Wolf of Wall Street, he gives some of the most motivational talks about you yeah. cranking out phone calls. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, uh, I mean, the way I would interpret that. And once again, I, I, I don't know Jordan. I don't know Grant. So I, I never judge a book by its cover. I've never been through their training. I've heard bits and pieces, but I, I can never like, fully judge unless you've really gone through it. Um, in my mind, you know, cause a lot of sales trainers like that, especially with cold calling, they're like, oh, it's just a numbers game. Like it, you call as many people as you can. You're going to get that, you know, 99 no's and you're going to get that one. Yes. But the problem with that type of mentality is that your salespeople will take that as, as like the gospel and they'll focus on the quantity of calls mm -hmm. instead of the quality of each conversation. So in our mind, when we train salespeople in any type of industry, how to cold call, um, we're focused more on the skills game rather than the numbers game. So when I say skills game, I mean, what are the words they're saying? What are the questions they are asking? What, how are they using their tone that either is going to trigger the prospect to say, not interested, or we already have somebody for that if you're cold calling, because that's what you're going to get most of the time. Or how do I trigger uh, curiosity where they actually want to engage into a two-way conversation. And so a lot of times when I say that, people are like, no, sales is really a numbers game. And that's okay if you want to believe that. But your salespeople will buy into that and they'll never try to improve their sales ability for each conversation. I'll give you the equivalent. It's like, you guys watch NBA? Well, you sure. should watch me. Actually. Like Steph Curry. Yeah. Does Steph Curry believe that basketball is a numbers game or a skills game? 
hundred percent skills. Skills. Yeah. Because if Steph had said in high school, like, oh, hey guys, don't worry. It's just a numbers game. Shoot it as many mm. times as you can. You even get the eventually, yeah, it'll, right. eventually, pass you the ball. eventually you'll hit one out yeah. of 20. But the problem is if he had that mentality, he would have never focused on his technique day in and day out. He would have yeah. never been great because he just focused on the numbers, throwing it up as many great times analogy. as he can. He yeah, would have yeah. never made his varsity basketball team, let alone college and you know Davidson and the pros. Right. So Steph focuses on his technique every day, like his yeah. shooting hand, his you know his hips, his legs. I mean, you, you obviously know way more than this playing you know professionally and in college, but he's focused on his skill game day in and day out. Imagine if all of your salespeople in your company focused on their skill game day in and out, the words they were saying how they were saying the words, like the tone, how it come across uh -huh. and the questions they were asking. And when they got an objection, they actually knew how to help the prospect overcome it themselves because they were focused on the skills game. Can you imagine how much your lead costs would go down because you wouldn't have to go through all the numbers? Mm -hmm. Cold calling, you know, we, we, I mean, I tell you, there's some industries where we have, nobody's going to believe me, but I'll even give you the cold call. But there's some industries where we're, we're training certain cold calling techniques where they're getting like a 71, 72% um, conversation going into 10 minutes and booking it in. Like if they talk to 10 people, seven out of 10 are booking Holy it for the next cold call. call. Yeah. So if you know how to cold call, it becomes very easy if you have the right skill sets. But if you don't, if you're just going through the numbers game, yeah. like they're talking about, you, you know, you're going to get burned out pretty quick. Now we make a lot of referral calls. <laughs> yeah. So okay. we'll have a new associate that come in and they'll give us a list of their friends and family and, and we'll make the phone calls for them. So it's a little le le less than the cold calls, a little bit more Semi warmed up, yeah. But to the new person, to calling somebody's friends and family, still kind of nerve wracking. It's a cold call to them, yeah. But at least they can name drop the person referred. So, yeah. Um, what's your approach to mm. calling referrals? Um, so I, you know, it depend on where the referral came from. I'd probably something like this, and we would make it more industry specific. But I'll usually give you kind of a, a generic one. I'd be like, "Hey, is this John? Yeah, uh, John, Jeremy Miner. Um, a recent." Uh, one of your business associates, uh, Matt, had mentioned uh, that we're working with now had mentioned that you might have X, Y, Z problem. And he had thought that we might be able to do A, B, and C with you, something like that. Now, here's the, let me go back because I'm going to That's great that though, but I love, no, I love no, to no, fill no, in the blank. No, 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 no. Yeah. Let, me, let me go back. That was not that good. So it depends on if the, so what we would do in a referral situation is we would have the person referring tell the person that they, they were going to call. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you don't want to just randomly cold call that. It's not going to be as effective. So let's say if you're selling something and I might say, well, so you're uh, setting up the referral. Yeah. You want to set up the referral. So like you might, so, so, uh, you know, what's the best way to approach Jim? You know, Oh, this way, this way. Then I would say, well, should, should we maybe have you communicate to Jim that we would be calling right. first? Would that help him more if we did that? Yeah. Oh yeah. That's a really good idea. Well, what do you think you should say to Jim when you talk to him? Now, why would I want to set that up that way? Because most people will be like, when they talk to the person you're referring, they'd be like, well, I'm going to tell him about how you have awesome products and all this, which most people are like, oh, I'm not interested. I already have that. And though, so typically you want to like game plan with them what they're actually going to say to them because most of the time they'll ruin that. Right. So they'll say like, well, I'm going to talk about how you have the best this and you have this and you've really been helping this. Well, you could. Um, can I make a suggestion? Though? I love it. Yeah, yeah, you go ahead, Jim. Would it help him more if you talked about some of the problems that you guys were having and, and kind of how we solved those and maybe if he had some of the same problems as well, would that help him more if you kind of had that discussion? That's a really great idea, Jeremy. And when, so, okay, when are you planning on talking to them just so I know if I'll be available? And I'm getting the time frame they're going to talk to them now because what happens most of the time when you do referrals like this is they'll say they're going to talk to their friend and then you call you know the guy referring mm -hmm. to you uh, a week later, like, hey, did you talk to Jim about, oh, I haven't got around to it, I haven't done it yet, and then it never goes anywhere. So I'm gonna say, what's your time frame on talking with Jim, maybe later today or tomorrow to see if I'd be available? Now I'm putting a time frame in their brain. Oh, I'm gonna talk to them, you know, tomorrow at six. Now there's a time frame going off in their brain yeah. as it gets closer to six. Yeah. I still gotta talk to Jim. So when I talk to Jim, hey, is this Jim? Yeah, Jim, uh, Jeremy Miner, uh, a mutual friend of yours, Bob Woodward had asked me to call you as we're helping him with X, Y, Z. And he'd mentioned that you might be having some of the same issues they were having. Is this an appropriate time to talk? And I'm right into it. Okay. But I have to set that up by the person telling them mm. that we're going to call. So that's how we train people how to get referrals and actually make sure that the people giving the referrals are actually going to talk to them yeah. before you actually call. Cause it makes it way easier. I got, we're wrapping up on time here. Uh, we've got about another five or 10 minutes, but what, is there anything you want to inject, uh, Curtis? I, how do you stay up to date with 
all the different sales techniques because yeah. it seems like there's a new one that's being created and mm. you know, things like that. So yeah. like even when you're competing with your competition, like mm -hmm. do you, you know, you're obviously competitive playing sports and, and background as well. But rumor has it. Yeah, rumor <laughs> has it, right? But do you look I'm at a, your I'm competition? I'm a silent competitor that nobody knows. <laughs> uh oh, the sniper. The huh? sni you know, the, you know what I'm talking about the silent ones that nobody knows. There, there's a lot of. <laughs> outlandish ones they are like i'm the number one sales trainer in the world or we're the number one this and we're and at seventh level we're always like oh according to who like, <laughs> what, what leaders who, bull do you who, look at who, that, who right? ranked you back to curiosity who, who, who ranked you that was that yourself or like you'd never hear us saying that but your mom said okay. it you know yeah your mom said it. <laughs> your, mama. your mama said it i love it but my question really is, is that how, how are you staying up to date, um, yeah. you know, obviously outlasting your competition yeah. and position yeah. yourself that way? See, I'm a, I'm a person that ever since I got into sales, I, I'm like a sponge, like a thirst for information. Like, that's all I do. Like, you get better. Yeah, if you ask mm. anybody, like, well, they, they would say I'm weird because I don't listen to music. I'm really weird. I don't listen to music because- Even at the gym? No. No, no, no music. No, I can't. Well, I'm at CrossFit. They have music blaring. Uh, you know, I have to hear you that. You don't blaring. have any pump up music. No, I, I don't. I'm internally driven. Like I'm a. You know, I'm just. Mm. I'm just. I just. When you come to San Antonio, we'll be. You'll be pumping. Hey, it's so good. We'll, we'll I, fill you for the rear. I appreciate that. <laughs> See, you know, my my first sales training conference I ever went to when I was 21 it was after that summer of daughter sales, and I went to a conference with Brian Tracy. You guys cool. know Brian. Brian. Yeah. And, uh, and Brian said something there that stuck with me from that day. He said, use your vehicle as a university on wheels. Ah. And so I literally walked out of there and I'm yeah. like, I'm never listening to the radio again. Yeah. And I started listening to like, at that time of CDs mm -hmm. on sales from anybody I could, you know, and over the past 23 years, I don't know the stats, I'll have to look it up, but I've read, I've went through like 270 or 80 some sales training courses, right? And I still go through those. We'll talk about that in a second. And I usually don't go through them with sales trainers. I go through more with like uh, vocal trainers, like, you know, that might train actors or actresses. I go through like body language experts that read people like in the FBI, if they're lying or telling the truth. Mm -hmm. So like how to read body language. So we do a lot of different things, probably different, more psychology. So I can wrap any PQ around that. That's our methodology, neuro emotional persuasion questioning. Mm -hmm. And over the past 23 years, on average, I've read five books a month. Now, times 12 months a year. So that's about 60 books a year. And a lot of people say like, how do you have time to read five books? I don't read five. I typically read two to three, which takes some time, some dedication, because I have like 45 minutes a day dedicated to that. But two to three, I listen on audio when yeah. I'm driving around the car. Mm -hmm. And people are like, I don't have time to go, go through sales training. I'm like, how do you not have time? Like you're driving around. Right. Like I'll even be sitting there ironing my shirt and I'm weird. Like I ironed clothes. I don't like wrinkles. My mom taught me like no wrinkles in your clothes. So I'm, like, tell. I'm like ironing everything, you know? Yeah. And uh, I'll sit there and I'll, I'll put my phone on. And right now I'm going through like an advanced uh, body language course by a gentleman that trains like fortune 100 CEOs, 500 CEOs. And like, he trains a lot over in the EU, like uh, prime ministers and politicians, like how to present themselves to build trust with your hands and stuff. So I'm taking this course right now. So I'm always like refining. Cool, I'm yeah. always like, how do I, and I might, I might read a book on sales. It's really, really bad. Like I'm just being real yeah. that I'm like, I went backwards, but they said one thing in there. I'm like, ah, that's an interesting way they formed that question. It would work much better if you put in this word, this word, and this word, and then I'll rewrap it. And we call it, we any PQ it. That's what we, we kind of any PQ the question. So uh, you know, over 22, 23 years, it's been close to 1400 books on sales, persuasion, influence, plus almost 300 courses, which I still go through. I still go through a couple courses a month. So I'm a sponge. You want to be great at sales? People always ask me like, Jeremy, how did you get so great at sales? Like thinking I was born like, you know, super sales guy or something. And I'm like, well, I just outlearned everybody else. That's it. That's it. That's I what a CEO says. Just, I'll, I'll, I'll just improve, I'll, 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 I'll work. Yeah. Out to out to strategize and, and outlast. Yeah, the secret says um, so like I'll be sitting there ironing my shirt for five minutes and I'll sit there and and I'll get five minutes in. And then I'll get in the car and I'll drive ten minutes, I get ten minutes in. Then I get yeah. back in the car from maybe the chiropractor, I got five minutes. And all of a sudden, thirty two minutes. Uh, just uh, that day. Your brain I'm laughing you. Yeah. yeah. Uh sixty seconds left, Jeremy. So what's talk to our audience real quick. Talk to our audience of what they're know. going to expect in San Antonio here at yeah. Escape the Matrix. Yeah, I already, I already have the keynote ready. So we're gonna go over three. Th we're gonna go over three steps uh, that you'll need to master to get your prospects to view you as the trusted authority in their mind. So how do you get your each prospect you're talking to, to view you as the authority or the expert in what you're offering? So we're specifically gonna hone in because I just gave you a little nibble here. We're gonna hone in on 
uh, you, you know, becoming a problem finder and problem solver, not a product pusher. But we're going to give tactical skills, like what questions do you need to ask to get them to emotionally open up? Because you can have the greatest questions in the world, like we talked about, but it doesn't mean the prospects just be like, oh, that's a great question. I'm just going to emotionally open up to you and tell you everything. <laughs> like, you, how do you get them to want to do that, yeah. right? You learn how to do that, selling becomes easy. Second step we're going to talk about is asking the right questions, but at the right time, and especially with the right tone. And we're going to break down the different tones with different questions to make it uh, industry specific to what you guys do. And then the third thing that we're going to talk about is how do you eliminate sales resistance, like you talked about? How do we get them to let their guard down and become open to what we're offering? So we'll focus on those three main aspects. And if they come and they want to acquire those skills, they're going to leave with actually knowing how to sell more than the day they came in. That's what I always hate about going to events or or like reading books. I'd like read a book and I'd be like, oh, that was a really good theory, but I literally didn't learn anything that would help me sell more. So when I go to do keynotes and stuff, I don't do like motivational speeches. And I love that. But I think people there are already motivated. I need to teach them the actual tactical skills mm. to keep the motivation going because motivation will dry up quickly when the prospect, when you say hello and you don't know the right words, the right questions, the right tone, and you get slapped in the face, yeah. not interested. That motivation goes up very quickly. So if I can train them the tactical skills and they start selling a ton, guess what? They internalize, they internally motivate themselves and they don't need all that stuff. I love motivation, but it doesn't last very long if you don't have the right skills. That's right. And when you have skills, your confidence goes up. And your confidence yeah. goes up. You do you're motivated. More, and you do more, you sell more. Yeah. Can we sell more? You improve your skills some more. And you're pretty motivated because you're not afraid of the phone. You're not afraid of getting on yeah. Zoom. You're not afraid in person. Like if you have the right skills, you know exactly what to do from uh, step A of the sale all the way to the step, all the way to step Z. And you're internally motivated. That is the most powerful motivation in a human being is to internally get motivated. What was your greatest feedback? Please put it in the comment section below. And we got a couple books here, personally signed by Jeremy I'm Lee, sign mine it. himself, yep. too. So yeah, yeah. the best articulate comment we're going to choose, Curtis, I'm going to have you choose it. So therefore, people don't think it's me. Oh, you can be the bad guy yeah. <laughs> or the great guy. <laughs> and uh, we're going to pick the best comment. We're going to share it. And um, and uh, we're going to have a signed copy coming from our studio to your office. Yeah. That being said, Jeremy, thanks for being so yeah, generous with the time. For, we look thanks for having us on. And, and look, if they if they want more of some of these questions, because I know we didn't have time to get into them, yep. um, they're welcome to join one of our free Facebook groups. Yep. Uh, they can go to salesrevolution.pro. So salesrevolution.pro. And just say, I heard Jeremy on Matt and Curtis's podcast. Give me that black book of questions. And we'll have somebody on our social media team just message them a free book called The NPQ Black Book of Questions. There's like 240 cool. some questions for different situations they can use. So they're welcome to join that. Get and your black book. Get the black book. And if yeah. they want to go to Barnes & Noble, here's our Wall Street Journal bestseller. This is the first book. Uh, this was published about four months ago. It's going like crazy at Barnes & Noble. So if you're going to buy the book, if you want to learn how to sell more, it's a $17 book. If you need, a, if you need us to get you a GoFundMe page to be able to get this book. <laughs> let let Matt know who gets your GoFundMe page, but you can go to barnesandnoble.com, buy this book, New Model of Selling. Put a lot of tactical uh, training in this, not just theory, because theory drives me crazy. So they're welcome to get the orange book if they want to sell more. We want time. reality, your reality to change. That being said, thanks for joining us here on the Seven Figure Squad podcast. Make sure you follow Jeremy Lee Miner and my friend here, Curtis Eatman the fourth. The fourth? That's yeah. right. Jeez, I'm not even the fourth. Well, man from the fifth floor. Fourth. <laughs> I, mean, I love that. I love that the fourth, man. Thanks for joining us. Until we meet again, continue to live smart, continue to love smart, and be money smart today. today.